us on this lovely Wednesday evening. Welcome, welcome everyone that's joining us on Zoom and now on Facebook Live. Welcome to Northern Kentucky History Hour. We're gonna get started here just in one second with Janine Kreinbrink on what is the National Register of Historic Places and how do cemeteries get listed? But thank you all for joining us. And it is 6.30, so let's go ahead and get started. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Northern Kentucky History Hour. I'm your host for tonight, Mary Jane Calderon, joining you from my home in Fort Wright. Also joining me by the power of Zoom is my co-host for the evening, Heather Cook, and the lovely Janine Kreinbrink, our presenter for the evening. Thank you, ladies, for joining me. Uh, Northern Kentucky History Hour is a project of Barringer Crawford Museum, Northern Kentucky's History Museum, that would not be possible without support. Thank you to all of our sponsors, including the City of Covington, Kenton County Fiscal Court, ArtsWave, Kentucky Arts Council, Northern Kentucky Sports Hall of Fame, the Carol Ann and Ralph V. Hale Jr. Foundation, and our members. If you're not yet a member of the museum, please consider joining for access to discounts and exclusive programming. Learn more and join at bcmuseum.org. We would love to hear from our viewers tonight. So if you have a question or comment to share, please type it in the chat or Q&A feature on Zoom or message or comment on Facebook. And we'll be sure to get to those at the end of the presentation. Let's meet tonight's presenter. Back again this week is Janine Kreinbrink. She is the president and senior partner at k &B Cultural Resources Management, LLC, which she co-founded in 2011 with Doug Vonstro. She has combined a career in cultural resource management with conducting, conducting educational and public programs in archaeology, preservation, and history. Her archaeology career began at NKU, volunteering at BCM, where she has been associate archaeologist since 1981. She began a full-time career as an archaeologist in 1986, working on urban archaeology in Covington. Janine obtained her MA in 1992 from the University of Cincinnati and has worked as a professional archaeologist ever since. Janine serves on the board of directors for the Friends of Big Bone. She helped found and served on the board of the James A. Ramage Civil War Museum and also taught as an adjunct professor to the anthropology and history departments at Northern Kentucky University from 1997 to 2014. Currently, she serves as the registrar for the Register of Professional Archaeologists. So before we get started, there is a quiz question tonight. The first respondent to enter a correct answer in the chat on Zoom or Facebook Live wins a Northern, Co Northern Kentucky History Hour prize and most importantly, bragging rights. So Janine, would you like to go ahead and introduce that question? I will. The trivia question tonight is what cemetery was originally in what is now Davu Park. Wonderful. If you're ready to go, we can go ahead and get started. We're ready. Go ahead and share. There we go. All right. Hold on, we're going to go back up again. All right, this is a view of so the title tonight is Cemeteries and the National Register. So we're going to talk about cemeteries. First, I'm going to talk about what are the different kinds of cemeteries. And we'll talk a little bit about um, evolution of cemeteries through the 19th century uh, as we talk about uh, two local cemeteries. We're going to talk about what is the National Register and how do cemeteries fit into the National Register of Historic Places? And we're gonna use a couple of local examples for that. So let's get started here. So there are many different types of cemeteries. The smallest cemeteries or graveyards as some people call them are informal graveyards on private property. A lot of these are family cemeteries like the image of the one on your screen is a small family cemetery in Boone County. These are ones started by a particular family. They might have in-laws and other relatives uh, who are allowed to be buried there as well. Uh, they don't charge for burial, uh, very informal. There may be markers, there may not be markers. 
Another type of cemetery is called a customary cemetery. This is an image of one in Warren County um, on a property we're working on right now. And customary cemeteries are informal burying places, but they're used by multiple families. And they're usually found along uh, the side of a road, uh, maybe on a property line between uh, two different families' properties. And so the neighborhood, then they decide to share uh, that particular graveyard. This one has probably at least a half a dozen different families buried there uh, who are not necessarily related, uh, but they um, have just set aside a place in the neighborhood for uh, burials. Uh, also, there's no charge. Uh, people may dig their, uh, have dug the graves themselves for their family members, uh, for example, uh, but very informal. So many of these smaller informal types of cemeteries share um, some common characteristics. Uh, many of them, uh, as in this slide, uh, one has a wall around it. Another one has a wall, uh, a, a higher wall with an actual gate. Some of them have wrought iron fences around them. Uh, some of them don't have walls at all, but uh, walls are a common characteristic of many of these informal types of cemeteries. Most of these cemeteries, some of which are now in the woods and some are maintained, but a lot of them include some sort of domestic vegetation that has a symbolic meaning. Uh, this can be uh, Vinca minor, this uh, commonly called periwinkle ground cover, is often found uh, in 19th century local cemeteries. Uh, spring bulb flowers, uh, yucca plants, which came into this area, were imported in the later 19th century, and so forth. And all of these plants have a couple things in common. They're either evergreen, which means they stay green all year round, or they come up in the spring, like daffodils and spring bulb flowers, as a symbol of renewal uh, around Easter time, for example. Uh, small flowering trees like dogwood, and especially. Uh, Eastern red cedar trees, which is this tree here, uh, were commonly planted uh, in local informal cemeteries. Other local uh, hardwood trees like oak and walnut uh, were often either planted at corners um, or in a row perhaps uh, that to mark the location of the cemetery. Another category of cemeteries are church cemeteries. And um, I've got two pictures here. One is St. Mary's and one is Big Bone Baptist Church Cemetery. Um, St. Mary's, this particular St. Mary's is located out on the Dixie Highway in Fort Mitchell. And uh, this is the cemetery. Uh, the original cemetery was in um, Devoe Park right in front of the museum. And we may come back to that later. So cemeteries um, are obviously associated with some type of religious denomination. Um, some denominations more commonly set up cemeteries than others. Uh, Catholic churches usually had cemeteries somewhere in town or in the vicinity. Um, some of the local Baptist churches uh, have cemeteries. Uh, several of the local Lutheran churches have their own church cemetery. And when they're started, they were usually adjacent to a church building. Uh, and that holds for like the Lutheran and the Baptist cemeteries. The Catholic cemeteries were usually started out away. They're not next to the churches, at least in the local area. Um, some of these uh, church cemeteries survive even though the church is gone, but they were all laid out formally. And this is a map of a church called the Union Baptist Cemetery in Cincinnati, which is an African-American cemetery. And we'll come back to that uh, later as well. But 
you can see it has um, sections that are named, are numbered. It has names. It has uh, a layout with a, a like a road in the middle, and this is very common. But almost all of these formal cemeteries um, are platted, which means that someone's drawn a map to show the different sections, and the lots are sold. So in order to be buried in one of these cemeteries, you have to buy a lot or a plot uh, like in other uh, in modern cemeteries. Another, uh, the other category then are public cemeteries. And these are ones that local municipalities, it might be a, a, a city or town, um, a county uh, in Ohio, a township, sets aside a plot of land uh, to set up a cemetery so that anybody in that area uh, who can buy a lot can be buried there. Uh, a lot of these cemeteries, uh, this is a picture from Linden Grove in um, Covington. A lot of these cemeteries also set aside a pauper section where people who could not afford uh, to, to buy a lot could be buried um, or if someone uh, dies um, in that town um, that's traveling or has not been identified, uh, they can be buried there as well. So these are platted. They're generally recorded in a deed uh, book or a county record book. Uh, lots are sold. These cemeteries uh, evolve through time and we'll come back to how that happens and why that can be significant in a little while. Um, and sometimes they are closed and moved. And we have a perfect example of that with Linda Grove because the first cemetery in Covington was called the Craig Street Burial Ground. And we're gonna talk more about that later too. And then they closed that and they opened Linda Grove and then they kind of closed Linda Grove and opened Highland Cemetery, which is out on the Dixie Highway in uh, Fort Mitchell. Uh, but they did not move Linda Grove, they just started the new cemetery. So that's what can happen to public cemeteries. All right, so we've looked at the different kinds of cemeteries and we'll come back and talk about how they can be eligible for the National Register in a little while. But now we're going to kind of back up and we're going to talk about the National Register of Historic Places. Um, so the National Register is administered by the National Park Service. And the National Register of Historic Places, and I'm not going to go into all the background of um, the National Register, um, except to say that it was started in 1966 as part of the National Historic Preservation Act. And there are four criteria which we're going to go through uh, for being listed on the National Register, but there are also exceptions. So there are types of properties that are generally exempted from being listed on the National Register unless you can kind of find a way around that and find other reasons for them to be listed. So the properties that are ordinarily uh, quote unquote, shall not be considered eligible are buildings that have been moved, the birthplaces or graves of important persons, uh, because where a person is buried is not or should not be the most significant place associated with that person. Religious properties such as churches, just as a church, cemeteries, which I bolded, reconstructed properties, so if something is gone and then is rebuilt. Um, commemorative properties such as statues or properties that have achieved significance within the last 50 years. And 50 years then, of course, is a rolling date. So right now we're looking at 1973 as the 50 years ago. So things older than they were built um, longer ago than 1973 uh, can be evaluated. Uh, there are exceptions to all of these, and we're only going to talk about cemeteries. Um, there are exceptions to the 50-year rule uh, for highly significant uh, properties. All right, now I'm going to read this just because it's a quote um, about why cemeteries are generally exempted 
And it says individual and collective burial places can reflect and represent in important ways the cultural values and practices of the past that help instruct us about who we are as a people. Yet, for profoundly personal reasons, familial and cultural descendants of the interred often view graves and cemeteries with a sense of reverence and devout sentiment that can overshadow objective evaluation. Therefore, cemeteries and graves are not among those properties that are ordinarily, well, I quoted this and it's, it's kind of backwards, um, properties that are not considered eligible for inclusion in the National Register unless they meet special requirements. And I put down here, which you can't see, but on my slide at the bottom, it says there are objective criteria exceptions. So the whole idea behind this is that, you know, everybody thinks where their ancestor is buried is highly significant, whether that's an objective assessment or not. And so the National Register is an attempt to take a step back from that and try to find objective reasons why things should be considered eligible for the National Register. So we're going to look at the four National Register criteria. You only have to meet one of them. There are four different ways to list uh, properties. And then we'll kind of look at how cemeteries fit into those uh, criteria. These are just some examples of different uh, local or regional cemeteries. So the first criteria is criterion A, and that uh, properties can be associated with events that have made a significant contribution to the broad pattern of our history. Oh, hold on, there we go. There's the John Rankin House associated with the Underground Railroad. Um, we have a, a Civil War uh, military battlefield. So Underground Railroad, and uh, Civil War uh, military engagements. Those are examples of the broad patterns of history. Um, civil rights is another one, um, transportation, expansion of railroad, um, many of those kinds of categories. And we'll come back and talk about which one applies to, uh, what broad patterns apply to cemeteries. We're just gonna go through these. So, and then at the top, it defines what, what a property is. It can be a site, like an archeological site. It can be a building, a structure, like a barn, uh, an object, or a grouping of these are called a district. And to be eligible, you have to meet one or more of the four criteria. And it also has to possess historical integrity. So the setting has to still be pretty good. It can't be moved, those kinds of things. So the first one is broad patterns of history. The second one is to be associated with the lives of a person significant in our past. And this is the toughest one to find an exception for cemeteries because where a person is buried is usually not the most important place associated with them. So if you want to, um, list a cemetery because of a person is buried there, they cannot have another building. So like the house that they lived in or the business that they worked at or uh, a church or any other building, you, you can't have anything else associated with them. It, the cemetery can be the only place. And we'll, we'll come back to that one too, because there is a cemetery locally that fits this criteria. So the third one is mostly for architecture, uh, embodies the distinctive characteristics of a type, a period, or a method of construction, represents the work of a master, like an architect, or possesses high artistic value. This is the Frank Lloyd Wright house um, in Chicago. Really, really awesome house, by the way. You can tour it, it's really cool. So C is for, architecture and in cemeteries you can fit you know monuments and uh, mausoleums and things like that if they're uh, highly designed. Criterion D 
is where archaeology generally fits in, um, has yielded or likely to yield information important in prehistory or history. And in cemeteries, often um, a cemetery can fit this category only if it's being moved, because otherwise you're not going to excavate the graves um, in a cemetery that's not being moved. And so the below ground archeological um, significance cannot be evaluated. Uh, I've got a remote sensing picture on the left. I don't know if that's my left or your right, but anyhow, the blue image is um, some remote sensing that we had done actually in Linden Grove Cemetery uh, in an area that had no grave markers to try to figure out if there were graves. And obviously there are rows of graves um, there. So that's uh, one way to look at things archeologically. All right, so how can a cemetery get listed? Most of them get listed under A or C. So broad patterns of history or you know, some architectural significance. These are some pictures. Um, one, uh, the one with the statue is from Spring Grove and the other one obviously is Linden Grove Cemetery in Covington. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of these uh, and how they uh, meet uh, Criterion A. So Spring Grove Cemetery, and this is kind of in general for most cemeteries that fall under Criterion A, that rural landscape cemeteries all share certain essential landscape characteristics, a wide array of artistic and architectural tombstones, monuments, mausoleums, and sculptures, curving roads and pathways that tend to follow topographic contours, all manner of vegetation, including both indigenous and exotic trees. Um, many of these cemeteries that date at least to the mid 19th century uh, have state champion trees in them uh, for size and age, abundant shrubbery and a diversity of herbaceous plantings, lakes and ponds and sweeping vistas. And this can be on a small scale, can be on a large scale. Obviously Spring Grove is at the higher end. It was designed by a well-known landscape architect in the 19th century, um, has, has amazing um, architecture, and it certainly has the sweeping vistas and the setting uh, that qualify under uh, Criterion A. And it's called rural landscape, not because the cemeteries are out in the country, but because they are designed landscapes to look as if you are out in the country. So you can be walking to the cemetery and all of a sudden you're surrounded by trees and plantings and uh, you know ponds and curving paths. So you're not looking straight through the cemetery except at a, a lovely view uh, around a bend or um, you know across a hill. So that is one of the primary ways that especially designed cemeteries fit under Criterion A. And I've just got a couple of really pretty views. This is also um, Spring Grove. Here's another beautiful picture from Spring Grove to give you the idea of the vistas and also some of the, the amazing monuments and um, funerary architecture. So most cemeteries that have been designated in this fashion um, as having significance for their distinctive design and the profound influence that this had on future cemetery design and management, including social attitudes toward death and cemetery usage, funerary architecture. And then that got translated from the cemeteries into urban park design and planning. So many of the ideas that began as how to design a, a rural landscape in a cemetery got transferred into how can we make a city or a county park look like this. Uh, Davu Park fits into this category um, from the, it was 
founded in 1910. And as you drive around in Davu Park, you get that same feeling with the vistas and the tree plantings uh, as you would say driving around uh, Spring Grove Cemetery. So it, it influenced things out beyond just cemeteries. And that's uh, one of the reasons that Criterion A is so good for these kinds of cemeteries. Talk about Linden Grove um, next. So Linden Grove was listed under criteria A and criterion C, and A for Covington Early Planning and Development, and um, C for 19th century cemetery design and the rural cemetery movement. And it's kind of funny because they, those both are really criteria in A, um, and I'm not really sure how it fit into criteria in C. I know a couple of the mausoleums in Linden Grove are listed as examples under C, so I think that's probably where it fits better, um, but I didn't write it, so that's, that's the way it is. Uh, but those are the two reasons uh, for uh, Linden Grove. So this is oops. Um, oops. Hold on, trying to get my notes. This is a map from um, Covington, and it shows uh, the cemetery location down in the lower left. You could obviously it's not the cemetery yet. So in 1833, Western Baptist Theological Institute formed and in, they bought 370 acres in Covington. Um, the, I don't know if you all can see, it's kind of close up in there, but uh, it's all the area around 8th, 9th, down to 12th, um, and then 13th. So the cemetery, what's now the cemetery location, this should be come 13th Street here, and then 12th um, is probably here. Anyway, it looks a little different now than the original plat. So in 1837, um, a lot of things happened with the Baptist Theological Institute, but in 1837, they sold part of the land to the city and then some of it to uh, many developers who started platting out streets and neighborhoods. And this area in the Southwest was sold to Covington for a new cemetery that would replace the Craig Street burial ground, which was up between 5th and 6th Street um, on a little street called Craig Street, uh, where, the, where the railroad crosses over 6th Street now. That's where the Craig Street burial ground was. And it was already full. And in 1843, Linden Grove Cemetery opened. So between uh, these two different criteria, they're, they're all kind of part of the same thing. So the rural cemetery movement with the curving paths and, and the vistas, you can see that exemplified in the northern part of the cemetery. See all the, this is laid out in concentric circles and we've got curving paths around the, the lower water feature area um, in this northern part. And the reason that it is listed under the evolution of urban cemeteries is that this southern part down here is what is known as a lawn cemetery. So it's almost as if you're in two totally different cemeteries in the same place. If you walk around Linden Grove and you go over here and it's, you know, all of this curving paths and then you come down here and you can pretty much see from one end to the other uh, in the cemetery. Uh, it's pretty flat, excuse me. And that um, kind of exemplifies the evolution of cemeteries. So after the Civil War, 
was kind of a trend away from the rural landscape and the curving paths, and presumably into you know easier maintenance uh, with very regular plots, um, all about the same size and organized in a rectangular fashion, uh, and all that. So that's one of the um, reasons that the uh, new was considered eligible. <coughs> Excuse me. Now I want to talk about a couple of interesting things. So Linden Grove is a very is, is so interesting, and I spent a lot of time in Linden Grove Cemetery. And I had uh, I was lucky enough I taught a class at NKU one fall of 2009, a historic archaeology class, and we spent pretty much the whole semester in Linden Grove Cemetery. Every Tuesday night we went to Linden Grove Cemetery. And my students documented over 4,000 grave markers, and we made maps and made Excel spreadsheets, and we listed all the names and all the epitaphs on the graves and all the decorative elements on there as well. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm going to mute for a second because I need to cough if I can find a way to mute myself. Sorry about that. <clears throat> we'll see if I can talk again. All right, so the students put together a lot of interesting research <clears throat> on the cemetery. And I think it goes to show how the cemetery can be almost considered archeological under criterion D <clears throat> because of the information that you can get just from analyzing the grave markers and the people who are buried there. Um, all right, hold on. Why are you not fast forward? Why are you not going? There we go. All right. So the flow class <clears throat> based our research uh, at Linden Grove uh, on the, everything that they found out that semester. Here's a few views of them out there uh, documenting graves and, and writing down information and all that. They came up with the forms and everything that we used. So here's just some of the examples that of information that they came up with. The students divided into groups then and did did all this research in teams. And so they researched symbolism by gender. So they found that women had by far had more symbols than men on their grave markers. Uh, some of the reoccurring symbols on women's headstones included shaking hands, <clears throat> which means farewell and friendship, roses, Praying hands, uh, trees like willow trees, um, hearts, uh, and doves. Those were the primary ones. There were more, but those are the primary ones. And on um, men's graves, the uh, masculine symbolism uh, included arrows, Masonic symbols, owls, military crosses, shields, anchors, uh, swords. And um, one's associated with organizations. There's a, the one up in the upper right is uh, Masons um, or uh, Odd Fellows, that sort of thing. I think there's a, a deer on the one in the lower right. They documented many men's markers with quote unquote feminine symbols, um, but no women's markers had any of these uh, quote unquote masculine markers. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, what they figured out. Another student, and this turned out to be very interesting, they took the data um, that we got off all the grave markers of when people died, and they correlated that with um, available information on when there were epidemics and <clears throat> pandemics that came through Cincinnati, and they correlated very strongly with these time frames. Um, for example, 26% of the people buried at the cemetery died between 1900 and 1904. So it was amazing how some of these correlated with some of the different epidemics. Um, 
17%, for example, with the uh, flu in 1918, 1919. Uh, a couple of other students um, research um, the types of grave markers and how people chose them through time and, and which ones were more popular. Um, the tall ones on the left are the tablets and hold on. Oops, but I have slides showing pictures of those. Tablet markers are the upright markers. Hold on. Do, 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 do. The lower right is a tablet marker. So that's the tablet. Um, the one above it is called a chest marker. And then there are um, ones that are angled, which are slant markers, and flush, obviously, flush to the ground, for example. Monuments are like the tall obelisks. So they track that. Another a couple of students um, <clears throat> researched uh, military or one student document military graves through time, how many from which different wars um, based on the markers. Uh, these are our, some of the military markers that are uh, in the cemetery. There's a few other examples of uh, some of the types of markers associated with uh, military graves. Another uh, student or two researched epitaphs um, by how old the person was, like from zero to 10 years old, uh, just how old they were was the most common, sometimes with a, uh, a, a saying, um, 10 to 20 years old relationship was most popular, daughter of, son of, wife of, uh, 20 to 40 also relationship and 40 plus the same. So those are some of the examples of the demographic and the cultural and, and other, we would say anthropological or archeological information that can be uh, researched at a cemetery to show that it, it can provide significant information. And so, <clears throat> so we've seen that they can provide significant information under A and C. Um, D is a way to research information, usually through archaeology or, as I was just saying, uh, through demographic research, uh, which is kind of like above ground archaeology, if you think about it like that. We are almost at the end. I have one more cemetery to talk about. So criterion B is the hardest, the toughest one to justify. Because like I said, where a person's buried is usually not the only place associated with them. Um, in which case you're supposed to go look for that place, right? If they have a house or uh, some other building or, or something associated with them, then that's what should get listed on the National Register, not where they're buried. But Union Baptist Cemetery in Cincinnati is uh, has provided an interesting exception uh, to this idea that criterion B is the toughest one because it is listed um, one of the criteria it's listed under is criterion B. And Union Baptist Cemetery is um, an African American cemetery. It was founded in 1865. It's the oldest African American cemetery in this region in its original location and a formal cemetery. So I have to, to separate that. Um, especially in Kentucky, there are many African Americans buried in informal cemeteries, uh, family cemeteries or customary cemeteries, and whether that's if they were enslaved and buried there or after the Civil War. Um, and there are African American uh, people buried in Linden Grove Cemetery, but Linden Grove Cemetery was not founded as an African American cemetery by African Americans. So in 1865, it was founded by uh, a Baptist church to be an African American cemetery because a lot of the local cemeteries were re formal cemeteries were refusing to allow African-Americans to be buried there, including Spring Grove Cemetery. 
uh, among other public cemeteries in Cincinnati. And so they were kind of restricted as to where they could be buried. And so they set up uh, this cemetery as a, a separate place where they could be buried. What well, is listed under criterion A and B, so A for the Historical Association with African American Civil Rights and with um, uh, African American history in the local area, and also under B, and that's because the cemetery contains the graves of more than 100 African American veterans of the Civil War. Most of them were buried between 1886 and 1899. Um, so not, they, you know, they died during the war, but when they died, they were buried there. Although not all were members of the Union Baptist Congregation. And the reason that the cemetery qualifies is that this cemetery is the only place left to commemorate their lives. Uh, the person who did the research for the National Register nomination that was listed in 2002, um, she could not find houses or where most of these people lived because most of the congregation from Union Baptist lived in the West End of Cincinnati. And we're talking about the area that's now under I-75 uh, as it comes through um, out of Kentucky into Cincinnati. And so there are no houses left. There is no place left uh, from the 19th century to commemorate their lives. Uh, one of the most important uh, members of this group is Powhatan and Beatty. Um, if you had ever been to the Ramage Civil War Museum, we had a whole display on Powhatan and Beatty, uh, who was a Medal of Honor winner in the Civil War. And this is where he is buried, in Union Baptist Cemetery um, up on the west side of Cincinnati. So. That's one of the examples of uh, how Criterion B can be met. Um, it is a tough one, but it can be met. A and C and even D are a lot easier. So we're almost at the end. I can't go to the next slide until we're ready to answer the trivia question. So otherwise I'm done. Do we go ahead and answer the trivia question so I can stop sharing my screen? What do you want to yes, do okay. here? You can go ahead and give the answer to that, Janine, if you All want. All right. So the answer is St. Mary's Catholic Church. Um, the Diocese of, well, it wasn't quite the Diocese of Covington then. It was still part of Cincinnati. They bought 10 acres up on the hill in 1840, and they set up St. Mary's Cemetery and um, started burying people there. By 1860, they had only used up less than two acres of it, and I, I don't know if it was just not accessible enough, but they decided to buy a much larger tract of land out on the Dixie Highway in Fort Mitchell. Um, in the meantime, of course, the DeVu family had bought up all the surrounding land, so they couldn't expand out of their 10 acres. And so 1867, um, they sold some of the property to the DeVu, so all they had left was 1.86 acres. Um, in 1900, the DeVoos bought the rest of the cemetery. So when they donated the land in 1910 um, to become part of, to become DeVoo Park, the text here in the middle says a tract of 1.86 acres in Kenton County and being the same conveyed, et cetera, et cetera. 1900, the above tract being the old Catholic cemetery. And this is a drawing that was made in 1900. And there's a photograph showing where at least some of that cemetery was. And it's that big grassy area right out in front of the museum. And there are probably people still buried in there. So they did, some graves were moved to St. Mary's um, in the 1890s and then between 1900 and 1910. But we've identified, I think about 70, burials at St. Mary's that were probably moved from Dubu Park, but there were, there, there, there are some things. Anyhow, so that is the end. If anybody's got any questions, I'll go ahead and stop sharing. All right. Thank you so much, Janine. That was fascinating. Um, thank you. Let's go ahead and um, announce our winner of the trivia. Yeah, the winner was um, Mary Casey Stirk from Facebook Live. So congratulations. Excellent. 
Mary, you'll get your prize in the mail. Congratulations, Mary. Okay, and what kind of questions do we have, Heather? Yeah, so our first question is, did Linden Grove have a potter's field? Yes, it did. Actually, the remote sensing picture that I showed is from the potter's field, and it was the very southeast corner along the south edge of the cemetery. So if you come in, so that, like if you come in on 13th Street and you go all the way to the other side of the cemetery and find the southern fence and look for where there are no grave markers, that's a potter's field. And then um, somebody was saying that the Gaines property in Boone County is approximately two acre family cemetery from the 1700s and 1800s. Um, and the, there's a rock wall in disrepair and there was a family farm there and they were wondering who they could contact to resurrect the rundown cemetery. Is it on private property? They did if not. It's on, oh, okay. Um, I would suggest contacting Bridget Stryker at the Boone County Library. She's also on the Boone County Historic Preservation Review Board. So I would suggest starting with Bridget. Uh, it's Bridget Stryker at Boone County Library. Um, and she can offer suggestions or information because if it's on private property, you have to have that property owner's permission, you know, if you want to go in and clean it up. Um, if it's on, on public property, then, you know, whoever's in charge of it, but, uh, but I would start with Bridget because they probably have some history on it there as well. Because they, they should have the cemetery files. Um, Did your students survey Linden Grove section 24, the old woman's home? If it had grave markers, we listed them. And I know our inventory is on, I believe Covington Library's website. It might be on Linda Grove's website too, but I know that the spreadsheet that we put together is on um, the library's website. And what the students documented were all of the grave markers we could find. And that was over 4,000. There are over 20,000 people buried in Linda Grove Cemetery based on their paper records. So that means 16,000 people do not have grave markers in that cemetery. So um, depending on, on, on where that section is or whether they had grave markers, if they had markers, they're in the inventory. If they didn't, they're only in the paper records. And I think Covington Library has those records. Uh, I think most of them are online now where you can search by name. Um, the next question is, what disease was the third pandemic? Hold on. I don't have it listed here, but I expect at that point it was influenza. The earlier ones are things like typhoid, um, yellow fever, um, things that are caused by like bad water and, and things like that. The later pandemics or epi and epidemics are things like influenza and polio. Um, and uh, measles. So I would guess influenza. I'd have to go double check my other files, but I think that's probably what it is. Yes. Um, the next question is wondering if you have any ideas about how many graves are still on the museum slash park grounds. I don't know. The original church burial records are gone. So there is no, we know, I'm sure it was platted. We don't have that plat. I haven't been able to find it. now. There's another cemetery in Covington um, out on 26th Street that was called Buena Vista Cemetery or St. Joseph's. And those people got moved when they opened Mother of God Cemetery. 
the plat for that cemetery is in a deed book at the courthouse, even though it was a Catholic cemetery. I keep hoping that if I just go look through enough books at the courthouse that I'll find the plat for St. Mary's, but I haven't found it yet. But the diocese has no records. That, that little drawing that I showed you, that's the only record that the diocese has on that cemetery. And we, like I said, we created like 70 names or families based on the records at newer St. Mary's, uh, but they don't have the old records. They don't exist. So we don't know, some at least, I'm sure are still there. Um, and someone else was saying that they have an ancestor who is listed as buried at O'Rourke Hill in Boone County, and we're wondering if you had any idea where that is located. O'Rourke Hill? I don't know. O'Rourke Hill. Um, called Bridget. Or there's another uh, historian there named um, Hillary in Boone County, but call Boone County Library and ask to talk to the history department. Um, they might know. I I don't know where O'Rourke Hill is. Is that the family name as well? I don't know if they can answer that, but. Uh -huh. So I'm gonna call Bridget. Mm -hmm. And there's a question on Facebook Live. Um, wondering if this information is available to print. And I think it was typed about when you were talking about your student survey, or maybe it's just all the information from the, um, from the whole history hour. Well, obviously it'll be on your YouTube channel here when we're done. Um, like I said, the spreadsheet of all of the grave markers is online. Um, these individual um, pieces of research um, are not. Um, one of the students from this class wrote, there's an article in the Kenton County Historical Society magazine on St. Mary's. So there is a published article on St. Mary's. That's, that's from, uh, from my class. Um, but no, the, these individual pieces, I have, they have not been published yet. Mm -hmm. As Any questions? As of right now, that's all we have. We got, we done with questions? We are. I think we did have some comments though saying, uh, thanking you for this oh. wonderful presentation and how great it is, so. Just want to let Welcome. you know once again. We always look forward to you joining us on History Hour. So thank you, Janine. Cemeteries um, are near and dear to my heart. I love cemeteries. Okay, I guess if it's about that time, we'll go ahead and um, talk about some stuff going on at the museum for oh, everyone yeah. to check out. So um, let Heather get that pulled up. Um, this is the last week to see Dancing with Nature. It's our wildlife photography exhibit of the natural world in Northern Kentucky through the lens of Kira McNeil. There's many different animals, heron, starlings, deer, um, there's insects. Um, the photographs are all framed too with salvaged repurposed wood from old structures on her farm. It's really an amazing exhibit. So um, you've got till August 13th to check that out. And we still have on display on just through August 20th, so there's time is running out on this one as well, is the Art of Fashion, Faye Applegarth Maddox. Um, the elaborate drawings uh, were from um, Faye Drew for her one-of-a-kind illustrations for advertising in the local newspapers. So um, be sure to check that out. Our next Music at BCM concert is tomorrow evening at 7 p.m. We have Losing Lucky. This energetic five-piece group will perform music made popular by the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Tom Petty, Fleetwood Mac, Adele, and others. So those uh, that will be uh, tomorrow. Doors open at six. Please bring chairs and blankets for seating. We're hoping there's not going to be any rains, but in case of rain, we will move indoors. And it's not listed on this um, this uh, 
on this graphic, but um, we will have another concert on a Tuesday, which I know it's crazy Tuesday, but we are rescheduling our performance at Blue 80 that we had to cancel mm -hmm. um, due to rain. So um, that's going to be on Tuesday, August 15th. So that means two concerts in one week. Very exciting. So please be sure to check out the complete music at BCM schedule on our website at bcmuseum.org. And there's still time to register for Chippy Sensational Kids Club. It's going to be all about dogs. Um, so preschoolers and their parents are invited to celebrate the long, hot days of August with positively adogable stories, barktacular crafts, and doggone fun activities inspired by man's best friend. Uh, there's a $3 materials fee per child plus museum admission, and we do ask that you register at least three days in advance by calling the museum at 859-491-4003. Lastly, our next Northern Kentucky History Hour is going to be on Wednesday, August 23rd with country singer, uh, music singer, Bobby Mackey. That's going to be a great show. So please tune into that. And I also want to thank everyone for um, that's answered our survey that we sent out. We sent out a survey about possibly switching um, the night of Northern Kentucky History Hour from Wednesday to Tuesday. We had great feedback. Most of you um, were okay with that switch. Um, so I think we're going to make that switch in October. There will be uh, more information um, coming soon about that. But thank you to everyone that helped us out with that. And also for more Northern Kentucky history throughout the week, check out our Facebook page and our YouTube channel where you can find the latest curators chats along with all of the past Northern Kentucky History Hour presentations. So please like and subscribe. That's all that we have time for this evening. So thank you again to all the sponsors and supporters of BCM. Until then, take care everyone and good night. Thanks everyone. And thank you, Janine and uh, Heather so much. Have a good night. You're welcome. Good night, everybody.